Welcome, everybody. It's so nice to have you with us today. I'm Kelly Pirtle with NOAA Communications in Norman, Oklahoma, and I'm also a member of NOAA's Central Region Collaboration Team. I will be your host for today's webinar on winter weather. I'm very excited to kick off our 12th three-minute thesis webinar. These speakers have some interesting information to share with us, and I can't wait for you to hear their presentations. Today's webinar, as I said, is focused on winter weather. It's a natural topic to talk about in January. The NOAA Central and West Regional Collaboration Teams have worked together to bring you the latest information from a range of experts. Our presentations will include exciting research on thunder snow, new approaches to serving vulnerable populations, understanding roadway hazards, emer emerging impacts from climate change, and other topics. Each of today's panelists will have just three minutes and one slide to cover their topic. This format is based on a model used by universities across the country as a way to briefly share information about a project, initiative, or research. You can see from the outline, after each group, we will take a break for questions from you, our audience. And near the end of the hour, all of the panelists will return to respond to your questions for a few minutes. At any point, during the presentations, please submit your questions in writing using the questions pane of the GoToWebinar panel. Asia Shumalo, the coordinator for the NOAA West Regional Collaboration Team, will be taking your questions and sharing them with our presenters. We're also being assisted today by Bethany Perry, the coordinator for the NOAA Central Region Collaboration Team. We are, good news, we are recording today's webinar, which will be available Monday on the NOAA Central Region Team's webpage. We'll post this in the chat near the end of today's webinar, and you will also receive it via email. Finally, we'd really love to get your feedback from this event. Please take a moment at the conclusion of today's webinar to complete a very brief survey. So let's get started. One thing I've learned over the years working with meteorologists is just how difficult it can be to forecast winter weather. Zach Harris, a meteorologist at the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Boulder, Colorado, will speak about these challenges and how the local office located in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains messages these uncertainties to their partners and the public. I'll now turn it over to Zach to get us started. Hi, thanks Kelly. Uh, so today I'm gonna to be talking about the challenges of winter weather forecasting. So. One of the questions we always get as meteorologists is how much snow are we going to get with the storm? And while that may seem like a relatively straightforward question, the answer is always masked in a layer of unknowns. But what are these unknowns and what can we do about them? In general, we can break these down into two parts, the uncertainty of the forecast itself and the struggle to communicate it properly. Predicting in the modern era requires a forecaster to sift through an endless sea of data. The access to the data itself is incredible, but also brings many challenges. And this is especially true when every piece of guidance gives a different answer to a very complicated puzzle. Take, for example, the two images uh, on the left side of the screen that should be appearing uh, larger now. In these examples, each of these lines represents a different forecast for a winter storm only a couple of days away. While these are great at giving you the range of possible answers, it doesn't give you the answer. Now take that, multiply the range of possible answers, and you get the, the idea that all of the data of a single forecaster has to ingest. Adding another layer of complexity to the forecast is terrain. As any forecaster in Colorado would tell you, the mountains are beautiful, but also quite a pain to deal with. Whether it's blocking cold air or blocking the radar beams we use to see a storm, a tall mountain range can always get in the way of an effective forecast. In this forecast example from a few weeks ago, uh, waves of rain and snow were supposed to emerge off the higher elevations and stall over the Denver Metro. Just a few hours before the event, the plumes that you see on the right were the range of solution from a single model in Denver. In case you can't see the numbers, that's a range from a quarter inch of snow to over a foot. Maybe the mountains aren't as fun as they seem. So the goal of a forecaster is to first try to put the puzzle pieces together. Using a lot of data, pattern recognition, and a little bit of luck, a forecast comes together. Then the lingering question is, how do we get this information out in a way that the people understand? While our forecast grids, the foundation for all National Weather Service forecast products, give you a deterministic forecast, meaning each variable has an exact value, is that the right thing to tell our partners and the public? More and more, we're finding out the answer to that question is no, and that the answer lies somewhere in the probabilistic world. 
The weather service's shift into probabilistic guidance helps tackle a lot of the problems we face when communicating winter threats. On the screen now are just a few ways we can help guide users to the answers they need. Maybe someone wants to know, hey, what's the chance of seeing this impact with this storm? We can point them to the probabilistic winter storm severity index, which Dana will tell you more about later, which is still based on our deterministic forecast we've already produced. Maybe a school district closes the snow forecast exceeds a certain value. They can use probabilistic snow graphics that we produce twice a day, every day. We also try and use unique visualizations to show the changes of our challenging terrain. The weather can be wildly different going up the hill from Denver to the ski resorts, so we use our highway cross sections to highlight the change in elevation and the change in snowfall forecast for public users that may not be familiar with just how fun our terrain can be. The bottom line is we'll never get everything in a winter storm forecast perfect, but instead of giving our partners a single product and hoping for the best, we can take the things we know, use the increasing number of probabilistic tools we've been given, and help craft a message that our partners can use effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. That really helped us understand all the many factors you all and all of our great uh, National Weather Service forecasters deal with during the winter. Next, we're going to hear about work done after the blizzard occurs. Sean Carter, the lead for the Winter Hydrology and Remote Sensing Desk in the NOAA National Water Center Operations Division, will speak on the desk's three themes, sharing what they use and leverage to inform hydrologic forecasting covering the spectrum of water from drought to flood. Take it away, Sean. Thank you, Kelly. Good afternoon, everyone. So the forecast was issued, the snow fell, and after the winter storm warnings have expired, your landscape has been turned into a winter wonderland. That snow's importance might just be beginning. I want you to think of snow as a battery. As the winter wears on and that snow starts to accumulate, it's essentially charging that battery. In the spring, will that battery power a lovely spring freshette in the Northeast? Will it cause catastrophic flooding in the Northern Plains? Will the Western drought continue for another year? These are the questions that the National Water Center Winter Hydrology Desk seeks to answer to improve river, flood, and water supply forecasting. And to help us answer those questions, one of the tools that we use is Snow Data Assimilation System, or SNODEC, which is, in my humble opinion, one of the best, if not the best, snow models available to model a dynamic snowpack capturing snow water equivalent and other snow parameters across a massive and geographically diverse domain. Snow modeling is notoriously difficult, as Zach demonstrated in the previous brief, just forecasting. With uncertainty coming from our atmospheric models that force the snow model, the uncertainty of the physics inside the snow model itself, it gets rambunctious. The genius of SNODAS is the assimilation part. We take observed snowpack conditions and we assimilate those back into the snow model which helps us correct for errors in magnitude, placement, and timing. Uh, we can assimilate data that comes from snow tail, snow pillows, instrumented snow depth observations, and we also incorporate all the um, observations made by the Coco Ross community. And every day we receive around 5,000 observations with which to do that, but we still need more data, especially in instrument or population poor regions of the country or where all of our observations are just simple snow depth observations. So enter NOAA's Gamma Airborne Snow Survey Program. This is one of NOAA's most fascinating remote sensing programs that incorporates nuclear physics and a little black magic. The aircraft fly at 500 feet above the ground following the Earth's terrain, measuring the amount of gamma radiation that is being emitted by the Earth's crust. Gamma, fortunately, is readily absorbed by water, and with that relationship of gamma attenuation, we can figure out how much water is in the snowpack to within millimeters of accuracy. That data is then assimilated into SNODAS and the River Forecast Center SNOW 17 models, and it's a vital component to flood forecasting. Finally, snow isn't the only hydrologic hazard that um, is not the only hydrologic hazard for winter. River ice is an annual threat to block stream flow and cause flooding. Winter tends to have few blue blue clear sky days for electro-optical satellites to image the land surface so we can see where the ice is. So the National Water Center has been prototyping the world's only dedicated continental scale river ice surveillance program using synthetic aperture radar, which can image the land surface day or night and in all weather conditions. I think I'm coming up to my three minutes, so I'll hand it back to you, Kelly. All right, thank you, Sean. 
very interesting information. Our next speaker is Vanna Maluski. She joined the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory as a research physical scientist last year after working with the Cooperative Institute, CERO, for several years before that. She specializes in storm electrification and lightning research, ranging from lightning predictability to the meteorological implications of lightning data. She is currently studying lightning in winter weather with Lee, the Lake Effect Electrification Project. It's a lot easier to say Lee. <laughs> All right, tell us more about thunder snow, Vanna. Okay, thank you for that introduction, Kelly. Uh, first off, uh, if you're not already aware, what is lightning? Uh, lightning is an ionized plasma channel that is nature's way of moving around electrons to balance positive and negative charges that build up in a thunderstorm. These charges are separated when different particles, such as snow or smaller ice crystals, are bouncing off of each other in the cloud in the right conditions. It's a little bit similar to what happens when you rub socks on carpet. And except in a thunderstorm, there are trillions and trillions of particles all interacting with each other. When the conditions are right, pockets of cloud collect differently charged particles and the lightning suddenly tries to balance things out, just like the spark that might happen when you touch a doorknob or a light switch after walking around. Lightning can occur between a cloud and the, and the ground, or more commonly different areas within the same cloud. Uh, one thing that's important to remember is that it's always colder above the ground than it is here at the surface. So even when we're experiencing warm rain ourselves, thunderstorm clouds contain a variety of liquid water and frozen ice particles all interacting. Having a variety of these particles actually makes it a lot easier for charge to separate, but clouds can electrify even when it's much colder. When it's too cold for that liquid rain, and we only have frozen precipitation such as snow, and we still have lightning, we call it thunder snow. So thunderstorms with snow. Uh, lightning and snow is a lot less common since the conditions in a cloud are very, very different. Another thing that makes thunder snow really unique is that the cloud and the lightning itself is a lot closer to the ground than in a typical thunderstorm. In fact, many thunder snow flashes are actually triggered from tall objects such as towers or wind turbines, meaning that the lightning breakdown itself starts at ground level, which realistically means at the top of the tall object, and then travels up into the cloud from there. In ordinary thunderstorms, it is much, much more common for lightning to start in the cloud and then either remain in the cloud or travel to ground from there. Uh, we are studying lake effect snowstorms uh, because that's as close as we can get to a natural laboratory to study thunder snow. Lake effect snow occurs when cold air um, at or below freezing temperatures flows over a large warm lake, which happens really regularly on the east side of Lake Ontario. Just over Tug Hill in New York, there's an average of nine lake effect snow events, uh, five of which typically produce lightning just in the months of November, December, and January each year. That may not sound like a lot, but it's actually way more frequent than thunder snow elsewhere in the country. So instead of us chasing the winter weather, we can set up all of our instrumentation and then wait for winter to come to us. So this is exactly what we are doing in Project Lee the Lake Effect Electrification Project, which is a partnership with the National Science Foundation and several universities. We're using an assortment of ground-based and balloon-borne instruments to study the electrification in these snow bands. The region also includes some really interesting differences in terrain and land use. The elevation increases as you get off the lake over the Tug Hill. There are several wind farms already uh, in existence and more being installed, so we have those tall pointy objects to initiate lightning. We've been collecting data this winter to study lightning in these snow bands to see how it evolves as the snow moves off, and we're really excited to see what we can learn from this. And I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Vanna. Uh, good luck to you and the team as you finish up uh, collecting data in Lee the next few weeks. Uh, we will now take a few minutes to address some questions. You can type your questions in the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, Asia? Thanks, Kelly, and thank you to our panelists for your excellent um, presentations. Our first question is for Zach. Who are your main partners and what type of data do they need from your office? Uh, so our partners range anywhere from the local to the state level. Uh, usually that's government. So uh, anything from local school districts to city or county emergency managers, uh, and then as you work your way up the state, uh, we're heavily involved with uh, the Department of Transportation and uh, some state-level emergency management partners. And, and occasionally we go all the way up into FEMA Region 8. Uh, so we really cover anything from a small town to almost an entire region. Thank you so much for that, Zach. Our next question is for Sean. How do you assimilate SNODAS? 
How do I sim assimilate it? Or excuse me, how often? Can you repeat the <laughs> excuse oh, me. Okay. Thank you. Um, so two to three times a week during normal operations, if nothing is pressing, uh, if we're looking at rain on snow uh, flooding, we'll assimilate daily to make sure that we have the most accurate uh, water equivalency in the snowpack before that event. And we'll also assimilate daily before one of our partners needs to issue a water supply forecast, such as a reservoir operator that uses SNODAS as their, how much snow they have in, in, in their basin. Thank you, Sean. Next question is for Vanna. Does your research have broader applications outside of lake effect snowstorms? Yeah, so the same things that's happening in the snowstorms is actually happening in every single thundercloud everywhere. So one of the nice things about the lake effect snow is we're removing some other variables like the liquid rain and the hail growth and things like that. So whatever happen is happening there is also happening in our more complicated clouds in the summer over the central plains. So we can take whatever we learn there and apply it to every other cloud everywhere, which is exciting. There's still a lot about electrification that we don't understand. So lots of questions to answer. Thank you so much. We have time for a few more questions. Um, I'll go back to one for Zach. How do you make the highway graphics? Um, and I'm looking at one of the images on the right side of your, your slide. Yeah. So what we did and it's not a very simple process to to get the template for it we essentially traced a, a profile in google earth and then took that profile converted it into powerpoint and then took that made it pretty converted it to google slides and then uh, we have a script that pulls some of our data so it's our actual forecast data from our image system uh, that goes into the google slides template and it's it's automated so uh, for us, now that the template's set up, it's just a couple clicks of a button, and we've got all of our forecast data right in there uh, without having to manually type it each time. So it's been really fun to develop. That's really cool. Thank you. Um, next question for Sean. How do the airborne snow survey missions get tasked? Uh, typically, we coordinate those with uh, a river forecast center. Uh, we have 13 of which five that we, we do snow surveys for, I think, off the top of my head. Uh, so we'll coordinate with them uh, with our, we have a library of, I think, 3,000 flight lines across the country in Alaska. Um, so before uh, rain on snow or, or spring flooding, we'll, we'll fly the, all of our flight lines and, and get that data to the river forecast centers to help them inform or help inform them for their, their, their flood outlook. Thank you, Sean. Um, and then time for one last one for Vanna. Uh, how, or does supercooled liquid in the cloud contribute to enhanced thunderstorm or thunder snow and or convection? Yeah, so supercooled liquid is actually one of the really important ingredients to get very effective charge separation. So that does a lot for actually getting to the lightning part. Uh, and it's one of those things that's not present unless you actually have that convective activity to start with. So it's sort of a signal that you do have convective activity. All right, thank you, Zach, Sean, and Vanna. And right now I'll turn it back to Kelly for the remaining presentations. All right, thanks, Asia. And thank you, um, panelists. Uh, remember, you can type your question in the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel and we'll answer it. Uh, have you ever driven on black ice or tried to get somewhere in blowing snow? It's hard. Our next speaker, Heather Reeves, is interested in that and more. She studies how weather affects transportation and leads a team focused on the development of decision support tools for stakeholders in the National Weather Service and the Department of Transportation. Tell us more about what you do, Heather. Thank you. Yeah, winter weather is uh, beautiful to look at, like one of my um, colleagues here today said, but it's deadly. Um, can we go on to the next slide, please? Uh, there we go. Uh, this graphic, the bar chart on the left side of your screen, is a famous one that gets bandied about. Somebody went through and looked at fatalities tracked by NOAA, averaged over 10 years, and compared those to fatalities that happen behind a wheel of a car in the presence of snow or ice. It's an order of magnitude more than all of the other fatalities. And what also distinguishes these kinds of fatalities is that the 
other fatalities in green occur typically the majority of the time within a National Weather Service watch warning or advisory, which I've just labeled there as WWA, or we sometimes say WAWA. Whereas with the vehicle fatalities, the majority of these are not in a National Weather Service watch warning or advisory. So we have a pretty big health and human safety crisis on our hands when it comes to safe driving in winter weather. Many of our partners in the National Weather Service have a Pathfinder partnership with their local DOTs, and as a part of that, they have access to what are called ARWIS, or Road Weather Information System Observations, and these are temperature sensors directly in the pavement. In looking at an archive or climatology of ARWIS over several years, one thing we discovered is that in winter storms, when you're in the near zero degree environment, the whether or not the road temperature is above or below freezing, which is a critical indication of whether or not snow or ice can accumulate on the road, that's just all over the place. This map that you see looks like confetti because the observations are sometimes above and sometimes below freezing. There's really not a lot of spatial heterogeneity in this kind of environment. Even sensors at the same installation site, as these red and blue curves indicate, can sometimes disagree about whether or not the road is sub-freezing. Um, these two sensors are just in opposing lanes of traffic. That's the only thing that separates them. But yet for a period of several hours, one says the road is below freezing and the other one says it's above freezing. And for this reason, we think that taking a probabilistic approach to the prediction of road temperature is the better um, way to do it. I and my team developed a new tool that's being onboarded into the National Weather Service now called PROBSR, which stands for the probability of sub-freezing roads. This is a map from the recent December blizzard where we had four fatalities um, in northern Ohio along the turnpike. And we do have elevated values for PROBSR. We're looking to onboard this in and have it couple with other pieces of information about the weather so that we can provide decision support for hazards like accumulating snow and ice going forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Heather. That's really, really interesting and great partnerships. Um, Zach already mentioned the Winter Storm Severity Index, and our next speaker, Dana Tobin, will help us learn more about it. Dana is one of the scientists and developers of the index. She is a research scientist at Ceres, the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences, and works closely with NOAA's Weather Prediction Center. Welcome, Dana. Thanks, Kelly. Um, the Winter Storm Severity Index, or WSSI, is an operational forecast product that's available from the Weather Prediction Center. As part of the growing efforts of the National Weather Service to provide impact-based decision support services, WSSI uh, translates gridded National Weather Service forecast data into an impact severity scaling. It was developed to both assist National Weather Service forecasters in maintaining situational awareness of the potential significance of winter weather related impacts, um, but also to enhance the communication of hazards and impacts to external partners, media, and also the general public. The product combines winter uh, weather forecast data, winter climatological data, and non-meteorological data such as elevation, land use, and urban areas. Using geographic information systems, it provides a, a graphical depiction of the spatial distribution of possible winter impacts that is tailored to any given location within the U.S. For example, a two-inch snowstorm in Texas will have a higher impact than the same two-inch snowstorm in Michigan. Potential impacts are categorized into minor, moderate, major, and extreme impacts. Minor impacts inform users to expect a few inconveniences to daily life and warns motorists uh, to expect winter driving conditions and also to use caution while driving. Extreme impacts inform users to expect substantial disruptions to daily life. Motorists are warned of extremely dangerous or impossible driving conditions and that travel is not advised. Further, extensive and widespread closures and disruptions to infrastructure may occur, and life-saving life actions may be needed. A winter weather area is also depicted to denote areas where winter weather is expected, but where impacts are not anticipated. WSSI computes and displays these impacts um, 
for a storm's overall impact and for a series of six subcomponents, including snow amount, snow load, ice accumulation, flash freeze, blowing snow, and ground blizzard. The availability of these components allows users to interrogate which hazard the impacts are expected to originate. It's important to emphasize that WSSI provides only a guidance and is not a replacement for official watch warnings and advisories from the Weather Service. It's also not meant to be the single source of information for winter storms and should always be used in context with other forecast and warning information provided by the Weather Service. WSSI is a living product um, and we're continually making improvements to it each year. So please reach out if you have any questions, comments, or concerns for us to address in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Our next presenter is Reed Walcott. In his 12 years with the National Weather Service, Reed has gained valuable experience in Riverton, Wyoming and Las Vegas, Nevada. And in 2018, he returned to his home state of Washington as the Warning Coordination Meteorologist in Seattle. In this role, Reed serves as the primary liaison between the National Weather Service and its core partners. Tell us more about what you and your office do, Reed, to better serve Seattle's vulnerable population. Thanks, Kelly. Really appreciate that. Yeah, so service ex equity has been a big priority for us at our office uh, for several years now because we have such a diverse population here in the Seattle metropolitan area. And recently with Ken Graham coming on board as the new uh, director of the Weather Service, it's just re renewed our interest in really trying to get at some of the problems we have with uh, our, our most disproportionately impacted populations. But the question is, where are the gaps and how do we create a sustainable, how do we create sustainable service equity? So I could go, I could talk on for days about this stuff, but I'm gonna focus on four different partnerships that we've developed over the last year or two. Um, the first here is the, the RARIT group, the Regional Alliance for Resilient and Equitable Transportation. This is a work group made up of emergency managers, transportation providers, human services, and other community advocates that pilots different critical transportation strategies for our at-risk populations. For this group, we've provided a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one IDSS, as well as training specifically on the WSSI and probabilistic WSSI that Dana just spoke on. We've also developed a new relationship with our King County Regional Homelessness Authority since we have such a large population of homeless individuals in the Seattle metropolitan area. For them, we've identified that, you know, not only do we need to provide them with impact-based decision support services or IDSS, but also work with them to refine and evaluate the criteria upon which they activate their services because they need to be able to manage the resources, the limited resources that they have. We've also made strides with our public health partners and specifically public health uh, Seattle and King County. Uh, for them, we've gone through and again, provide specific IDSS. We've also reached out to them and developed uh, recommendation strategies for heat. And we're also working on cold recommendation strategies now that they then pass on to users uh, within their jurisdiction. We've also uh, coordinated on AMS presentations and public health presentations as a joint effort with uh, public health Seattle and King County. And lastly, we've partnered with Washington 211. And 211 is a nationwide service that's served by, you know, that has a different flavor in every state, but it's a human services um, effort to connect individuals with local services such as sh shelters, housing, um, elder care, et cetera. And for heat and cold now, uh, we both highlight the existence of 211 within our watch warning advisory products, but we also encourage our partners to share their shelter information with 211 and share that information on social media as well. So these are just some really simple examples of things that we've done in here in Seattle, and I'd be happy to talk more about this uh, with anybody that's interested. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Reed. It's now time for some questions. We appreciate those of you in our audience who have submitted them. Do you have a question you want to ask? Type it in the questions panel of the GoToWebinar control panel. Asia? Thank you, Kelly. Um, our first question is from the audience and for Heather. Any potential to extend ProBSR past one hour? Yeah, as, as a matter of fact, um, we've been working collaboratively with Dana at the WPC to have ProBSR folded into the WSSI, so it'll be part and parcel of that product suite. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, next question for Dana. What's the difference in the winter storm severity index and the SPIA index? Yeah, um, so if I recall, the SPIA um, is uh, almost exclusively for um, 
power lines and power outages. Um, so for our ice accumulation components of WSSI, we do rely heavily on their index um, and, and we really appreciate the work that, that they contributed um, to WSSI in that respect for it. Um, so in, in that sense, there is some similarity in those components. Um, however, WSSI it, as a whole has other components available and it's, um, we regard it kind of as a suite of products uh, where we have the deterministic, probabilistic and other um, uh, products available. Thank you, Dana, I appreciate it. Uh, next question for Reed. What events led you down the path of emphasizing service equity in your office? Yeah, so as I mentioned, this has really been a focus for us for a long time here at this office, but we really haven't been able to identify the gaps that we had. But really, it was the June 21, uh, 2021 uh, heat dome event that really triggered a lot of action. And while that event was tragic and that we lost over 150 individuals in that event, it did provide an ideal lens upon which to look at our products and services and the gaps within our communities um, and so between that, a regional service assessment and work that we did to put on an extreme heat workshop, we were able to identify these partnerships and, and strategies to help serve our populations better. Thank you for that, Reed. Um, I'll move back to a question for Heather. How can ProBSR be used to provide actionable decision support? This is where the uh, partnership with WPC is really exciting because we're working collaboratively with them to partner this information about the probability of the roads being sub-freezing along with other weather hazards like snow or freezing rain to start to make statements about whether or not there's accumulating snow, accumulating ice, black ice, or other hazards that may require different levels of decisions or kinds of decisions on the parts of end users. Thank you, Heather. Um, another question for Dana. Uh, do you have examples of how WSSI has been, or other examples of how WSSI has been used? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so I know that the Weather Prediction Center uses WSSI in their winter storm uh, key messages infographic that's distributed on social media. Um, it's also used by broadcast meteorologists. Um, we've seen it on the Weather Channel. Um, Amazon, we've been told, uses it for decision support for shipping and distribution centers. Um, and it's also available on other um, websites such as Pivotal Weather, where you can look at model data. So it, it has been um, far and wide distributed um, and, and for different use scenarios. Thank you, Dana. Um, and the last question is for Reed. What relationship do you believe has played or will play the largest role in improving service equity from your office? If I only, if I had to pick just one partner that, that really could start, a, a, cast a huge net, it would be partnerships with public health. Uh, partnerships with public health, they're already connected down into those most vulnerable communities um, across our CWA and, and from what I've seen talking to others across the nation now, um, it's really across the nation. And they have a lot of ties, they have a lot of programs, and they know who is out there serving these vulnerable populations. So if I could pick one, it would be get to know your public health partners. Thank you everyone for those answers and I'll turn it back over to Kelly. Thank you, some, some great questions and answers. Uh, we'll now transition to our final group. Our next speaker, Tom DiLiberto, will help us better understand climate and the future of winter weather. Tom is a contractor with Groundswell and serves as the climate scientist and science communicator for the NOAA Climate Program Office's climate.gov. Tom will take all of us on a wild winter climate ride, discussing how climate change is impacting our coldest season across the entire U.S. Hold on tight, Tom. Welcome everybody to the latest attraction of the NOAA Amusement Park, Winter's Wild Climate Ride. This image, I mean ride, shows how winter, the fastest warming season, uh, is warming across the United States over the last century or so, including about four to five degrees Fahrenheit of warming in the northern two United States. But this ride isn't one note. While the temperatures are rising, they aren't rising or having impacts the same everywhere. There's plenty of twists, turns, and loop-de-loops on this roller coaster ride, so buckle up. The ride starts now as we ascend into the northeast. 
There we go. Well, winners here are warming three times as fast as other seasons. And with that increase comes uh, an increase in precipitation as well. Most of more of which will fall as rain. Not great for skiing. Also bugs. Increasing winter temperatures means an increase in the number of emerald ash borers, which are killing trees. Uh, let's get out of here before the, the bugs eat this ride. On to the Great Lakes and the Northern Plains. Whoa. Here, warming winters are leading to increasing lake temperatures and longer ice-free seasons, which could mean counterintuitively an increase in lake effect snow for as long as temperatures stay cold enough. Meanwhile, an earlier snow melt in the northern plains is leading to warmer, shallower rivers in the summer, which could have major impacts to the ecosystems there. In other news, scientists expect a net human migration to this area in the next century as things become hot elsewhere. Uh, uh oh. This next part gets me dizzy. Watch out. Oh, next up, the West Coast. Too many spins. Uh, here, increasing temperatures are reducing mountain snowpack, impacting things like drinking water, irrigation, electricity production, and increasing wildfire risks. But precipitation actually is expected to increase, just with more of it as rain and more variable too, meaning years of not enough precipitation followed by years with too much. Oh, and salmon spawning habitats will also be affected as increased winter stream flow from all of that melting could bury salmon eggs and silt. Ugh, the ride to the southeast is bumpy. Hold on, this part of the ride is pretty dry. Uh, water already a scarce resource is going to get more scarce as winter precipitation falls more as rain and mountain snowpack continues to decline. And warming winters lead to more pests here too, like the bark beetle, which has already devastated forests in the region. On to the southeast, hold on to your grits. Temperatures here are warming at the slowest rate of all the regions, but who here likes mosquitoes? No one? Well, too bad, because they'll stick around longer and potentially expand their range, increasing the risk for vector-borne diseases like West Nile and dengue. On the flip side, increasing winter temperatures will let citrus trees flourish farther north. So yum, Carolina orange juice. The rise last stop is our fastest warming state, Alaska. The good news is that a warming winter actually reduces heating costs. The bad news, melting permafrost and melting ice is leading to rodent transportation issues. Decreasing sea ice is leading to more exposed coastlines and larger erosions and even the full scale relocation of communities near the coastline of the state. The ride's over now, but if you found this ride a bit too scary, don't worry. Like most climate rides, we humans can change them whenever we want to. And also make sure you check out the whole amusement park too. I hear on the west side of Noah land, there's a new satellite ride that's goes in to blow your mind. <laughs> All right, that was fun, Tom, thank you. <laughs> uh, almost two years ago in February, 2021, Texas and surrounding states experienced their most significant winter storm since the late 1980s. Mainly due to an increasing reliance on electric heat, the storm exposed deadly vulnerabilities. Here to tell us more about the storm, impacts, and messaging challenges is Lance Wood, the Science and Operations Officer from the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Houston. Lance, tell us more. Well, thanks, Kelly, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Well, I'm going to start off by talking about that February 2021 Arctic Air outbreak and also the winter storms that occurred with it across the South. Not only were winter storm warnings in effect across all of Texas, but also across New Mexico, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and also much of Louisiana. In fact, this was the first time every Texas county was under a winter storm warning at the same time, with two back-to-back -back winter storms spreading snow and ice across the state. Now, there are many record low temperatures set across the Southern Plains, especially on February 15th. For example, Oklahoma City minus six, Dallas five, Austin eight, and Corpus Christi, Texas, 17 degrees. This ended up being the most significant Arctic air outbreak for the Southern Plains since December 1989. Now, unfortunately, the storm caused a significant loss of life across Texas, with officially 246 deaths being recorded. Most of the deaths occurred in urban areas, with Dallas, Travis, Harris counties having the most deaths. And close to two thirds of these deaths were due to hypothermia, and many of these were from people in their homes. Other causes of death included carbon dioxide poisoning, and the loss of access to medical devices. At the height of the winter storm, 3.5 million Texans had lost power to their homes, and this is the primary reason so many people died. There were many reasons for the deadly power outages across Texas during the storm. Much of the attention, correctly, was focused on power supply. So think about power plant outages, freezing natural gas pipelines, reduced wind and nuclear power generation. But I'd actually like to talk about how it was possible that the Texas power demand reached a record 69 gigawatts during a winter storm. Now, to understand how, you have to go back more than a decade. Coming out of the Great Recession of 2008, Texas embarked on in an incredible binge of new housing construction. 
No U.S. state has built as many new homes as Texas over the last decade, and most of these homes use electric heat. Now, you combine this housing growth with a long-running historical trend toward electrical heating, and for example, you take a look at like 1950, less than 1% of Texas homes used electricity as their primary heating fuel, but by 2010, 62% of homes built in Texas use electric heating. The reasons Texas, as well as many other southern states, use electricity to heat their homes is the low cost and a climate that results in just 2,000 heating degree days. So electric heating with its lower capital and insulation costs is a much more economical option. But when you also factor in that homes in the South are less well insulated than homes in colder parts of the country, you can see a serious vulnerability exists when storms knock out power supply, especially during extended periods of cold or near record cold. So what can we do to highlight this vulnerability? Well, during winter storms, we now prioritize messaging that can save lives specifically during a power outage. For example, during this past December's Arctic event that occurred over the, the Christmas time, we relayed warming center information as well as indoor winter safety information that includes carbon monoxide detect detection and the dangers of carbon monoxide poisoning from generators and other sources. And with that, I'll send it back to Kelly. Awesome, thank you, Lance. Uh, it's now time for questions about these uh, last two presentations. Uh, what questions do you have, Asia? Thank you, Kelly. Um, great presentations, everyone. Uh, the first question is for Tom. What about ENSO? Will climate change affect El Nino and La Nina, which I know can have big impact on uh, winter climate patterns across the US? Yeah, this is a big question. Uh, we know, and so whether it's El Nino or La Nina can basically change climate patterns across the United States, really impacting weather conditions across uh, the mid latitudes in general. But the, the issue is that when it comes to climate change, there's pretty low confidence in exactly how our warming planet is actually going to affect El Nino and La Nina itself. But what we can say with more confidence is that the impacts from El Nino and La Nina are impacted by climate change. What that basically means is that if La Nina tends to bring dry conditions for where you are, they'll tend to be drier. If they bring wet conditions, they'll tend to be wetter. And that's the, the highest confidence thing we can say about what impacts El Nino and La Nina will be doing in the future. Thank you for that, Tom. Uh, the next question is for Lance. Looking at this past Christmas, Ar Christmas Arctic air event, how did the Texas electric power demand compare to the demand in February, 2021? Yeah, going into that event, that was on our minds. And uh, first of all, I'll say that it was not as cold and not for as long as what happened in February 21. Um, also, there was very little snow and ice, which really worked in our favor. But electricity demand actually hovered around 74 gigawatts on the coldest morning. And that surpassed that previous record I talked about that occurred in February 20, uh, 21 of the 69 gigabytes. But that 69 gigabytes didn't count for all the power that would have been happening if you didn't have the blackouts. Um, so we, we did use more power, but we were able to keep the power online, but I think mostly because of not having as much snow and ice. Excellent, thank you, Lance. Um, back to Tom for another question. You didn't really talk much about Hawaii in your presentation. Sure. Well, it's hard to say it's winter when temperatures are in the 80s every day. What sort of climate change impacts are felt across the Hawaiian island? Right, I felt like it would be fair to talk about Hawaii in terms of winter. They do have different seasons there since it's more of a tropical climate. So the biggest impacts when we're talking about Hawaii and climate change are more related to the oceans. So sea level rise causing coastal erosion and flooding, as well as coral bleaching, which could have a broader set of impacts on the local tourism industry, as well as the, the broader ecosystems for Hawaii. And then also kind of similar uh, you know, just those sorts of impacts where if it does rain in the winter time, it could also lead to heavier rainfall because of a warmer climate, which can then lead to increases of flash flooding. Great, thank you, Tom. Um, one more for Lance. Uh, how did this storm compare to the December Arctic outbreaks that occurred in 1989 and 1983? Yeah, in the introduction, I talked about how it being as cold as it was since 89, so it's really important to take a look at 89, maybe what was happening back then. Of course, power usage now is, is a lot higher with population increase. Um, and 89, the December 89 whole period was the coldest December for Houston on record. But if you take that chunk that was close to Christmas, that say the 21st to the 23rd, it was pretty similar to what happened in February 21. However, the um, electricity industry in Texas was far different then. It was uh, dominated more by vertically integrated utilities and there was little market-wide control. So it was much, much different. We do know that there were some generator outages and blackouts, but it was far, far smaller in magnitude 
to what happened in 21. The 83 electricity data is a little uh, tougher to find in detail, but it was it was colder, longer, um, and it was a more serious cold, and that actually set the record uh, U.S. Uh, high pressure in Montana that I believe still stands. So it was <laughs> they're both really cold events uh, for the Southern Plains and the Central Plains. Great, thank you. And I'm going to do one last question to Tom before I call the rest of the presenters back on the screen. Um, Tom, do you know? Um, if any economic impact studies have been undertaken that illustrate the effects, either positive and, or negative, of warming winter climates? So I don't know the exact reports, but I believe in the National, National Climate Assessment, they've taken a look at some of those economic numbers, looking at the positives and negatives, because there are, as I mentioned previously, some positives, especially for areas in the further and further north in the country, um, where you might see that reduction in uh, with warming temperatures leading to reduce of heating costs. But, you know, whether the that's balanced or overtaken or uh, over, you know, by negative impacts is, uh, is a question. But I believe the National, National Climate Assessment looked at it the last time it came out, and our next National climate assessment will be coming out next uh, fall officially so they'll probably in there be in there too great thanks for that Tom um, and at this point I'd like to call all of our presenters back onto the screen and welcome folks to enter any questions that you have into the question panel so that we can ask them now but um, I'll start with Zach um, the Marshall fire occurred last December can you talk about how your office handles such a different type of winter weather event? Yeah, that's actually a really good example of having to deal with multiple things at the same time because we had that fire, but we also had a six to 12 inch winter storm the next day. So, uh, you know, every day you, you go into the office not really knowing what to expect, but, uh, you know, once an event starts, you kind of just snap into that mode where uh, you know what your partners need and you know that what they're going to ask for and you just kind of go through it so uh, there's no real game plan for an event like that but it's just kind of part of the job that you get used to after a couple of years great thank you for that um, the next question is for vanna uh, what type of measurements are you taking in the lake effect electrification project so we have a whole suite of instruments up there between us and our partners um, one of them is a lightning mapping array. So that's a research instrument where we can actually map out the full path that lightning takes in the cloud from where it started to where it comes to ground and how fast it travels and everything. Uh, we have some balloon borne instruments that we're sending up into the snow itself. So there's an electric field meter, which goes up on a large balloon about the size of a U-Haul truck. And then also a particle imager. So we can see exactly what those snow crystals and grapple particles look like. So we have precise images of those. Uh, we also have some regular environmental radio signs, so just taking normal uh, environmental measurements uh, surrounding the lake effect snow events, and then mobile radar is up there as well. And then, of course, on the ground, uh, keeping record of how much snowfall is happening and everything else. So all, all the measurements you can possibly take, we're, we're trying to get them in. Great, thank you so much for that. And we got some kudos in the question panel um, for, for you guys. Just, they said, great study and incredible work you're doing in such cold. So, um, Next question for Heather. What validation efforts have been performed for ProbSR? Yeah, we validated against uh, the road weather information system observations of temperature, uh, and we continue to update those validation exercises every year to ensure uh, robust performance from the algorithm. Great, thank you. Um, and then I have a, just kudos for Reed, a comment from um, Matt in the I think Chicago weather forecast office. And it said super and an inspiring share on Seattle service um, from us in National Weather Service Chicago. A lot of key takeaways as we start to further explore serving the vulnerable populations in a large metropolitan area. Um, Fantastic. I would be happy to connect at any point. Great. Um, a question for Tom. Um, one question from the audience audience was how did you find data on how salmon would be affected? Uh, NOAA Fisheries is, has a lot of information. So fi uh, salmon are actually an interesting species because they, they're they both ocean-based and land-based. So you're talking about an interagency sort of effort between <laughs> between that. So um, that information was obtained not only from the National Climate Assessment, um, uh, which involves scientists from academia, but also across the federal agency. 
Great, thank you. Um, and then while I have you, Tom, another question. As a national agency, it makes sense to communicate impacts from the entire nation, and you did a great job of showing regional impacts. Is there anything NOAA can or is doing to communicate local impacts to local communities? Yeah, there's a lot of efforts that go down, and a lot of that is through, you know, uh, folks like the National Weather Service offices who are more in touch with and talking with some of these impacts on the ground compared to, let's say, us who are um, more at like NOAA headquarters or, or uh, larger levels or higher levels that are on the ground. But there are also programs within NOAA's Climate Program Office that work directly with local communities. The CAP-RESA program is a good example of that, um, who are working to not only help uh, communities understand risks and vulnerabilities with them, but also help them build resilience. And this is part of a broader project, which is going on at NOAA, which is the, the Climate Ready Nation Initiative, which will be rolling out more so in the next years or so. Thank you, Tom. A uh, question for Lance. What are you doing in your office to help prepare people for future cold, um, extreme cold events? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have a team that works on uh, impact type graphics and um, we really, really reviewed that going into this winter season, actually before the last couple winter seasons. Um, so again, I talked about how we really focused more on, uh, you know, in, in your home <laughs> winter safety, which is not something we really thought about that much until February 21. Uh, we had people actually pulling their grills inside, not understanding that, you know, a charcoal grill is not a good idea to be using inside. So we, we had a lot of work to do, you know, keep it pretty basic, but we also have to explain hypothermia and the dangers of hypothermia because we don't have that very often here. So that and, and working with emergency management um, to, you know, what do they want us to push at what time? So I think we're, we've got a better channel of communication now based on what they're seeing that's happening out there during the storm. Great, thank you, Lance. Um, a question for Sean, let me find it. Uh, this is from the audience. How are the gamma flight locations determined or prioritized? For example, are they regionally focused? Um, a lot of them are, are, have been laid out and we've been flying them for literally decades. The, the Gamma Airborne Snow Survey program is 40 years old now, maybe actually slightly older. Um, so they're, we, you know, we just have been flying the same ones over and over again. Now, what's interesting lately is every year we'll lose two or three of our flight lines every season due to new windmill or wind farm construction. And because our aircraft are flying at 500 feet, the pilots typically don't like seeing a, seeing a giant windmill right outside their windscreen. So we'll decommission a flight line that's been fouled by um, windmills. And then what we'll do is we'll look for an area in the same, um, same general area where the, the old flight line was. What we're looking for is essentially a 10 mile long segment that the pilots can fly at 500 feet safely uh, without too many turns in it. And it avoids bodies of water since we don't want to fly over an area that, that would not have gamma radiation emitting from it. Um, try not to fly over null values basically. Um, so that's how, that's how they get set up is Basically, we just fill the gaps of where the um, where the flight lines aren't. But otherwise, uh, we're trying to install new flight lines, for example, in Alaska. And that was based on Alaska's request to have more information on the snowpack at the end of the season for a particular underserved um, remote village that tends to get flooded in the spring. So, so we will establish new flight lines, and we've worked with the, the Alaska Pacific River Forecast Center where we should put those in those basins where they think the most important snow is that you know where the biggest snow is going to be found in those basins so we can get a more representative measurement um yeah i could go on way too long with that so i'll just <laughs> i think that'll that'll do <laughs> thank you for that sean um a question for dana are there other wssi products in development yeah um so I think I talked about the WSSI uh, suite of products. Um, so there's the deterministic version that I discussed. Um, we have a probabilistic version um, that's experimentally available. Um, Heather had talked about um, integration of ProbSR into another WSSI product, which is an hourly product um, in development that will focus on transportation impacts specifically. Um, and people have talked about Alaska, um, so we are actually actively developing WSSI for Alaska uh, to be available to our partners up there. 
Great, thank you. And there's another question for the audience from you. Um, and somebody missed it in the talk about whether the WSSI is primarily used for covering snow or if it's also used for covering excessive rainfall. Yeah, so um, WSSI does not cover rainfall, um, but WPC does have an excessive rainfall outlook. Um, so WPC does uh, cover that side of uh, precipitation, obviously not the, the cold version, um, but they do have rainfall products available on their website. Great, thank you. Um, a question for Zach. Your office in Boulder is surrounded by NOAA labs. Um, how do you use research output from those groups? Uh, so we kind of have a collaborative effort with a, a lot of these offices. Um, our forecast office itself is embedded in a larger research laboratory in Boulder. So uh, we're next to a lot of GSL or PSD scientists that, that are really doing some innovative stuff. Uh, so we work a lot with them. We use a lot of their data. There's a, a profiler that's out in Platteville right now that gives us a really good look at kind of the depth of our upslope, uh, our upslope flow. Uh, so there's a lot of different options and we really like the partnerships that we have uh, just even in our building itself. So there's a lot of cool things going on here. Great, thank you, Zach. Um, and then I have one final question for Heather. Uh, how dense is the road network, just interstates and highways or smaller streets too? Um, and what are your plans to expand? The road weather network, the, the observations themselves varies by the state. So some states have a really a robust road weather network like Ohio. Some states have very few, like Missouri just has them on a couple of freeways. And then the majority of the southern tier states don't have any observations at all. The road weather monitoring network, these ARWA stations are by state. They're DOT owned and installed and maintained. So in our capacity as a university research partnered with NOAA, we really have no um, say in where these networks could go, but it would be an interesting research project, I think, to do a feasibility study on the cost benefit analysis for installing these sites in other places or in, in more places. But generally speaking, they're just on highways and freeways. They're not installed in like city or county roads. Great, thank you for that, Heather. Um, and thank all of you. These have been really great questions from the audience and we've learned so much about this really relevant topic right now. And Kelly, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Asia. And yes, this has been an eye-opening webinar, and I love all the questions and discussion. Uh, I feel like I learned a lot of new things, and I hope you, our audience, did too. A big thanks to all of our wonderful panelists today, coordinators Bethany Perry and Asia Shumalo, as well as you, our audience. I hope you have enjoyed it. If we didn't get to your question, we will pass it along to the panelists, and they will send you a response by email. As a reminder, the webinar recording will be posted next week and can be found at the web page. Uh, hopefully, we were going to add the web page in the chat box, maybe. Um, but it's uh, look up NOAA's Central Region Collaboration Team. You can also uh, find recordings of past webinars online. As we end, please stay on for one more minute to answer a few brief questions that will appear on your screen. Your feedback really is helpful as we plan future webinars like this one. Uh, thanks again for your participation and have a fine day. And I don't know how to end this. Here we go.